Hey, 42 here. NASA is not only the world's premier space exploration agency, it's also one of the most recognizable brands in history. It plays a prominent role in countless films and TV shows, and its various iconic logos can be seen on everything from hot water bottles to hoodies. Just saying the acronym, NASA, conjures images of chiseled jaw astronauts posing beneath shining rocket ships, assorted super geniuses huddling around computer screens, and a random woman giving a dolphin a hand job. Wait, what? For all of NASA's undeniable excellence, over the years, this storied organization has had the odd mishap. Like the time the $300 million Mars Climate Orbiter was lost because one of its software systems used metric units and another Imperial. Embarrassingly, nobody even noticed until it hit Mars' atmosphere and immediately exploded. But there's been no blunder more bonkers than the batshit crazy dolphin project that NASA funded in the 1960s. In fact, forget NASA, this might just be the most absurd experiment in the history of modern science, involving interspecies sex, drugs, and a woman living in a flat chair with a dolphin called Peter. So buckle up your seatbelt and strap on your snorkel for the titillating tale of the NASA experiment that went so wrong, it ended up in a porn magazine. Have you ever wanted to read all those books on your to-read list, but you just can't find the time? Well, let me introduce you to Shortform. Shortform makes the world's best guides to non-fiction books. They're like book summaries on steroids. They're super detailed, so you get the book's key points at a deep level. They also have interactive exercises to help you apply the ideas you've just learned so you don't forget them. I use Shortform every day. I spend about 20 minutes during my morning coffee reading short form to check out new books. I also use it to remember the key points from some of my all-time favourite books that I've already read, like Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. It's great because short form gives you new insights about the books you've already read with their super smart analysis. Short form covers pretty much every non-fiction genre, including personal development, business and tech. A short form book guide that I read and really enjoyed was Atomic Habits by James Clear. The key lesson I took away from that one is that it's not about making big changes in your life, but it's about the small consistent actions you do every day, such as reading short form. Short form publishes new book guides and articles every week and subscribers get to vote on what books to cover. By joining through my link shortform.com 42, you'll receive a free trial and $42 off an annual subscription which is over two months free. So don't miss out on this opportunity and thanks to Shortform for sponsoring this video. Considering just how bad things got, and we're talking injecting dolphins with LSD bad, the project had its origins in some genuinely groundbreaking science. Being the brainchild of a rising star in the field of psychoanalysis and neuroscience by the name of Dr. John Lilly, Lilly was one of the first scientists to put serious effort into understanding animal intelligence. His early work largely concerned cats and dogs, but it soon became clear that if he wanted to find true intelligence in the animal kingdom, he was going to have to study creatures with brains as large and complex as our own. The bottlenose dolphin proved the perfect choice. Not only do they do well in captivity, their brains are actually bigger than a human's by about 30%, and their brain to body weight ratio, while smaller than ours, is larger than a chimpanzee's and similar to that of our human ancestors from around 2 million years ago. That's an eye-opening stat, and it led John Lilly to suspect that dolphins might not just be intelligent for animals, but intelligent full stop with cognitive abilities approaching our own. So, in the late 1950s, he set out to prove it, and it was during a pioneering study into dolphin intelligence that Lily made a startling discovery. Or, to be more specific, his wife did. She'd been hanging out by one of the dolphin pools, discussing some test results with another researcher, when one of the dolphins nearby appeared to be mimicking the sounds of their voices. It was almost as though it wanted to join in the conversation. Lily was already convinced dolphins were extremely intelligent, and as far as he was concerned, the fact that his own test subjects were trying to talk to him was his strongest proof yet. 
Excited about the implications, he switched the focus of his research from studying animal intelligence generally to the more radical goal of directly communicating with dolphins. The idea that we might be able to have an actual conversation with another species was so groundbreaking it was picked up by mainstream media. Lily made TV and radio appearances, and in 1961, he published his research so far in a book called Man and Dolphin. But this was much more than just a recap of his experiments. It included Lily's speculative visions for a future in which fluent English-speaking dolphins might one day have a seat at the United Nations. Now that might sound pretty mental. It is pretty mental. But Lily's book got quite a lot of really important people really rather excited, including legendary astrophysicist Frank Drake. Now, if you're a regular follower of the channel, that name will already be familiar to you. Drake is most famous today for the equation that bears his name, a mathematical formula that attempts to predict the number of advanced civilizations in our galaxy. And Drake was convinced that John Lilly's work on dolphin communication was extremely relevant to his own. Why, you ask? Well, in 1960, less than a year before John Lilly published Man and Dolphin, Frank Drake had kicked off mankind's as yet incomplete side quest to find intelligent life in space, when he completed the first modern search for aliens known as Project Osmo. But he wasn't simply interested in finding aliens, he wanted to make contact. But how on earth do you even attempt to communicate with an alien race whose experiences, culture and language are so incredibly different to your own? Yeah, you can probably see where this one's going. Drake saw trying to talk to dolphins as a practice run for first contact with aliens. So he spoke to his mates at NASA who promptly decided that the space race could wait so that a man called John could have tea and biscuits with a goddamn dolphin. And sure enough, they wrote him a massive check. The influx of cash allowed Lily to build himself a villa on the idyllic Caribbean island of St. Thomas. But this was no swanky holiday home. The nondescript exterior hid a top secret lab that Lily hoped would soon be the site of one of the greatest scientific achievements in human history. The villa was directly on the coast, with office space upstairs and a pool below that was replenished with seawater every time the tide came in. It was named Dolphin Point and finished in late 1963, by which point Lily had assembled a crack team of top scientists to begin working on his dream of direct human-dolphin communication. But a few months into the project, a young local woman by the name of Margaret Howe Lovett turned up at the lab out of the blue. Small islands are difficult places on which to keep secrets, and Margaret had been intrigued by rumours of a mysterious lab where humans and dolphins lived in close proximity. Caribbean island, secret lab, dolphin pool, Personally, I'd have assumed it was the lair of a Bond villain and stayed well away. But Margaret had Doctor no such qualms. On arrival at the lab, rather than being gunned down by a nameless goon, she was invited inside to see the dolphins for herself. She spent the entire day there, observing the animals and jotting down extensive notes that she then shared with the team later that evening. Now, Margaret was a woman of just 22 with no formal training as a naturalist, but she'd made some genuinely insightful comments about the dolphins and their behaviour. So insightful, in fact, that she was offered a job on the spot. And not just any job. Lily ultimately assigned her what was arguably the most important and controversial role on the entire team. Margaret was going to teach the dolphins to speak English. It was, to put it lightly, a big ask. If you happen to be an especially observant individual, you've probably already noticed that humans and dolphins are quite different. Even if dolphins were capable of understanding the English language, and that's obviously a pretty big if, there were some serious physiological challenges to overcome if they were ever going to actually speak it. Unlike us humans, dolphins don't have vocal cords. They don't even speak with their mouths. 
above water, they make sound in a similar way to most politicians, by forcing air out of their blowholes. There were three dolphins at the Dolphin Point lab, Sissy, Pamela and Peter. Margaret worked almost exclusively with Peter. He was the youngest of the three, and unlike the females, he was entirely untrained by humans, which made him something of a blank slate. To begin with, his lessons went spectacularly well. Whilst he wasn't able to form recognisable words, he was able to reliably imitate Margaret's speech patterns and inflections. That might not sound like much, but Peter had, in a couple of weeks, mastered something that would have taken a human child several years. Margaret was spending every minute of her waking life at the lab, but it wasn't enough. Every second spent separated from Peter was a second they could never get back, and when she left the lab and went home for the night, it emphasised the simple fact that no matter how much time they spent together, she and Peter lived in very different worlds. As far as Margaret was concerned, that was a big problem, and she came up with a truly radical solution in order to overcome it. If she was going to bridge the gap between man and dolphin, she had to tear down the natural barriers that stand between us. So, with Lily's permission, she had the entire first floor of the lab waterproofed and flooded with fine deep seawater. She then installed all sorts of unusual furniture, including a desk that hung from the ceiling and a bed that stood on a raised platform. By the time these strange renovations were complete, Lily and Margaret had created the world's first and probably last, Dolphin Human Flat Share. For the following six months, Margaret lived there with Peter, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Despite the radical change in living circumstances, Peter's progress, so promising to begin with, slowed to a crawl. He was extremely adept at mimicking sounds, and he understood a wide range of simple instructions, but his ability to use the English language, or even form recognisable words, was going absolutely nowhere. Not long after Margaret and Peter shacked up together, NASA sent Carl Sagan to see how their money was being spent on St Thomas. Yeah, that Carl Sagan. Unfortunately, Sagan wasn't particularly impressed with what he saw. He was convinced Peter was simply mimicking the sounds Margaret was making with limited, if any, understanding of what those sounds actually meant. Worried that things were getting out of hand, Drake and Sagan attempted to realign the focus of Lily's work, recognising that teaching dolphins to speak English was likely to remain firmly in the realm of science fiction rather than science future. They recommended that Lily turn his attention to better understanding how dolphins communicate with one another. The astrophysicists had some pretty good ideas on how to do it too. For example, Drake had come up with a clever experiment to test whether dolphins could communicate complex ideas to one another through their language alone. It worked by separating two dolphins so that they could hear each other but not see each other. One dolphin would be shown how to obtain food by following a seemingly random set of instructions. If the second dolphin suddenly started following the same procedure, despite having never been shown it by his handlers, it would demonstrate advanced communication capabilities. But that wasn't enough for Lily. Proving dolphins had language of their own would be interesting, but opening up a genuine line of communication with a non-human species would cement his place in history. And so Margaret's lessons with Peter continued, but they weren't without their issues. As a young male dolphin in the process of reaching sexual maturity, Peter had certain needs. And it turns out, horny dolphins find it almost impossible to concentrate on their lessons. Something I'm sure every schoolboy can relate to. By this point in the experiment, Peter had grown extremely attached to Margaret, and when he was feeling particularly fruity, he started to rub himself up against her legs, giving her what I suppose you'd have to call a good old wet humping. To begin with, Margaret solved this issue by giving Peter some time with the two female dolphins in the pool below. But the arduous process of transferring Peter between the lab and the pool was a tricky one, requiring lots of time, several people, and a makeshift lift. 
precious hours were lost to this complex maneuver. So to save time, Margaret decided to take matters into her own hands. And by matters, I mean Peter's penis. Whenever he grew distracted by thoughts of porpoise-based porn, she would manually stimulate him to orgasm, at which point they could then continue their lesson. Despite the focused flat chair toothledge and regular hand shandies, Peter's progress had stalled. His ability to mimic Margaret's voice was better than ever, but he still wasn't able to form words, and he was nowhere near being able to use language to communicate his thoughts or ideas. Margaret wasn't worried. She was convinced they were on the cusp of a breakthrough. If only she could molest Flipper, I mean Peter, a few more times, then he'd soon be a seaborn Shakespeare. But Dr. Lily saw things differently. By ignoring the advice of Frank Drake and Carl Sagan, he'd ruffled a few feathers at NASA. He needed concrete results, and he needed them fast. Now, the swinging 60s are synonymous with hippie culture, and between them, Margaret Howe and Peter the Dolphin had certainly given new meaning to the words free love. But as Dr. John Lilly grew more and more desperate to demonstrate tangible progress, he turned to another of the 60s defining symbols for inspiration, mind-altering drugs. In a lovely little coincidence, it was the wife of Ivan Tors, producer of Flipper the Dolphin, who first introduced John Lilly to LSD. And over the course of the 60s, the study and taking of acid began to overtake his interest in dolphins altogether. But as Peter reached his language plateau, Lily realised there might be a way to bring these two very different research areas together. LSD wasn't just being used by tie-dye toss pots in tents to get tit-faced, it was also being trialled for all sorts of weird and wonderful applications, from curing mental illness to mind control. Having run dozens of LSD, experiments on himself, Lily knew all too well that it had the ability to expand the mind and encourage new experiences. In attempting to teach a dolphin to speak English, Lily was trying to touch the mind of another species, and he figured a little LSD might help to bridge the divide. And so he dosed both the dolphins and himself with the drug. If you're picturing dolphins lying on their backs contemplating the stars swirling above with huge grins on their faces, you are thankfully mistaken. Despite several attempts, the dolphins showed no sign of being affected by the drug at all. Still, the dose proved fatal for the experiment as a whole. Several prominent members of the research team promptly quit, and Lily's funding was cut short. I'd love to say our story ends there, but unfortunately, one final tragic chapter remains. The experiment may have been over, but whilst Margaret, Lily, and the rest of the research team could simply go home and move on with their lives, the fate of the three dolphins was far less clear. In the end, they were transported to a small lab in a converted bank in Miami. Conditions there were truly awful. The dolphins were kept in tiny, chlorine-filled tanks that were too small to swim in, and there was no natural light. Even more importantly, at least for Peter, there was no Margaret. We can't speak to dolphins, Lily's experiment proved that, but you didn't need to chat to Peter to know that he'd fallen in love with Margaret. When the experiment ended, she was taken away from him for reasons he didn't understand, and he never recovered from the heartbreak. A few weeks after his arrival in Miami, he sank to the bottom of the tiny tank and stayed there, refusing to rise to the surface to take a breath for several long minutes until he was dead. Animal suicide is a controversial topic. To truly call Peter's death suicide, we need to be sure that he had a solid grasp of abstract concepts like life and death as well as an understanding that his actions would ultimately kill him. But whether or not you choose to call it suicide, soon after John Lilly's experiment concluded and Margaret went away, Peter the Dolphin was sadly no more. 
After Margaret got over her grief, she ended up marrying the experiment's official photographer, and they were allowed to move into Dolphin Point Lab, where Margaret had lived so happily with Peter. Luckily, her new husband didn't find it the slightest bit weird to live in the same house as his wife's slippery ex. And the happy couple went on to raise three children there. The lab was never fully converted into a family home, and it remained partly flooded until they eventually moved out. As for Lily, he fell pretty deep down the LSD rabbit hole, becoming something of a counterculture guru in the swinging 60s and beyond. For a couple of decades at least, he was more drug addict than scientist. Earlier in his career, he invented the sensory deprivation tank. You know the thing Eleven gets into, so she can use her remote viewing powers in Stranger Things. Lily mostly used his personal tank to heighten his trips when taking drugs like LSD and ketamine. And it was during one of those journeys into his own mind that he became convinced the world was being manipulated by something called the Earth Coincidence Control Office. I started this video by talking about an acronym, NASA. And I'm going to end it the same way. If you're old enough to have played Mega Drive games back in the 90s, the Earth Coincidence Control Office, or ECHO, will almost certainly be familiar to you. ECHO the Dolphin was a surprise smash hit on Sega's all-conquering console. Few people who played the game ever knew about the strange man and the even stranger experiments that inspired it. Lily's NASA-funded dolphin experiment was largely forgotten about after its conclusion. That is, until it appeared in an issue of Hustler in the late 1970s, titled Interspecies Sex, Humans and Dolphins. The piece was pure filth, and there was a public outcry about the things that had been done to Peter and his pals in the name of science. Most NASA-funded experiments end up in scientific journals, the fact that this one found its way into a porn magazine certainly wasn't ideal as far as John Lilly and Margaret Lovett were concerned, but it did help cement this strange story's place in the history books as one of the most outrageous experiments of all time. So long, and thanks for all the fish.